I'm going to talk to you today about the heart. The heart is a fascinating organ. It beats more frequently than every second. And in an average lifetime, it beats about three billion times. The right side of the heart pumps blood to the lungs where it's oxygenated. It goes back to the left side of the heart where it's pumped all around the body to give um, the body the oxygen and the energy it needs to perform daily functions. But like other organs and like every piece of machinery, things can go wrong and the heart can fail in different ways. Vessels can become blocked. Um, the structure of the heart itself can become defected and, and dysfunctional. The rhythm of the heart can become um, affected and the muscle of the heart can fail. And this is a big problem here in Ireland. It affects about 90,000 people at the moment with about 160,000 people with impending heart failure. So that's about a quarter of a million people that have or will have heart failure. And not only that, but every year there are 10,000 new cases. So this costs us a lot, and the, the cost to the Irish healthcare system is, is a hefty 660 million euro. And if there's 10,000 cases new every year, it's inevitably on the, on the up, and this is only going to increase. And to people, it affects them a lot, so their quality of life can be very affected. 80% of people that have heart failure have symptoms like fatigue, breathlessness, ankle swelling. So heart failure, to define it, it's the impaired ability of the heart to either fill with or eject enough blood to meet the demands of the body. Now, luckily for us, cardiac device engineering has helped a lot in recent years. And we can see different trends in the way cardiac devices are changing. Um, he, shown here in this picture are some um, implantable cardiac devices, a total artificial heart, a pacemaker, a stent. Some people in the audience may have some of the de these devices in them at the moment. But the trend is for things to move towards being softer and being more biological. So here we see a stent that keeps the vessel open, but it degrades over time, a bioresorbable stent. Um, this is a heart valve that, that has a metallic frame, but it has tissue leaflets from a cow or a pig. And then a complete tissue valve as well that can be from another person or from, um, or from an animal as well. And things are even further moving towards taking cells from other parts of the body and injecting them into the heart to regenerate scar tissue and using different types of biomaterials, natural or synthetic, to uh, help the cells stay in the place they're needed. So things are getting softer and things are getting more biological. But in end-stage heart failure, the devices um, remain like this device shown here. This is a left ventricular assist device. It takes blood from a failing heart from the apex of the heart or the point of the heart and reroutes it to the aorta where it's pumped around the body. So it essentially takes over the functioning of the heart. It's implanted in an invasive procedure, and it has an external controller and an external battery. So this has done a lot for patients that are waiting for a heart transplant, but it's still rigid. And one of the big problems with it is that it contacts blood and it predisposes patients to blood clots. And, and the patient has to be on blood thinners or anticoagulants as long as they have this device. So when I was doing my PhD, I thought, there must be a way to develop something that does the same thing, that helps the heart to pump, but that's softer, that's inspired by the biology, that's more natural. So um, somebody st said earlier, um, seek understanding before you do anything. Um, and that was what I did. So to fix a problem, we need to really understand it. Um, so I did a lot of research and read every paper I could and looked at how the heart moves. And we have um, the advantage now of having really advanced imaging technology. So here I show on top um, speckle tracked echocardiography. So it's an ultrasound technology. And basically we can see different parts of the heart and how they move as the heart beats. And you can see at the top of the heart, shown on the left, and the bottom or the point of the heart, you get this twisting motion of the heart as it beats. And the twist is in opposite or opposing directions. Um, so it's like near, almost like the wringing of a towel to um, effectively eject blood from the heart. This is shown in the bottom as well using a different Im imaging technology called MRI. 
Um, and at the time, I said, surely there's a way that we can recapitulate this motion or recreate it using some kind of robotics. At the time, there was a huge um, burgeoning new field called soft robotics. And a colleague of mine, Donald Holland, spoke last year at this event and introduced the field of, of robotics. But it's typically inspired by nature, by biology, and scientists or engineers use soft elastomeric materials um, with simple cavities, and by designing them effectively or reinforcing them um, with fibers or with different types of material, they can achieve really complex motions and really mimic um, how body parts or animals move without complex programming. So I wanted to use this technology and help the heart. So a roboticist, who is my advisor, a graduate student, that was me, and a surgeon walked into a bar, and this is where the magic happened. So it wasn't really in a bar, but we did put our heads together and we came up with a vision and kind of creating this collaboration between different minds. Um, we came up with a vision. And our vision was to replace the current left ventricular assist devices with a, a heart sleeve, so something that wrapped around the heart and moved in the same way that the heart did, but provided that ac extra bit of um, augmented, augmentation of the muscle function to allow the heart to effectively pump. And one of the key things was, was that it would be non-blood contacting, so it wouldn't contact the blood at all, and the patient wouldn't have to be on blood thinners at all. So it would act as a bridge to transplant, so the patient could wear it while waiting for a, for, um, a heart transplant. And we looked to the, um, the, the architecture of the heart muscle to inspire the design of this heart sleeve. So there's three layers of muscles in the heart, and they're oriented in different ways. Um, the heli helically oriented muscles help the heart to twist, and the circumferentially oriented muscles help the heart to squeeze. So we thought we can build different sleeves that do different functions and combine them to get simultaneous compression and squeezing. And then I had to go back to the lab and say, how, how am I going to realize this? So I started with building the small contractile elements. And these are artificial muscles. Um, they basically behave like a balloon, but by reinforcing them with fibers at predetermined angles, you can control how they move. So when they're pressurized with air or with any sort of fluid, you get linear contraction. And then if you embed multiple of these actuators into a soft matrix, like a silicone, and selectively actuate them, you can get different types of motion, depending where you actuate and what pressure you actuate to. So um, in essence, you can build a soft, active material. And we wanted to build this in the shape of a heart, and I really wanted to recreate that twisting motion of the heart that I mentioned. So we 3D printed different molds that allowed us to cast in different layers a silicone structure with embedded actuators that could be individually pressurized, and that would um, result in a twisting motion. So we made this simulator, a soft active material that moves just like the heart moves, so it achieves that, that twist. Um, and also we built a computational model so that we could predict how this was going to move. So we weren't just going to the lab and building things that we didn't know how they'd move. We could design them beforehand and know exactly how it would behave and help that to optimize number of actuators, orientation, and things like that. So we ended up with this um, simulator that each of these lines goes to a pressurized air source. And when, they're, um, when the little balloons are inflated, you get twisting motion. And we could also achieve the counter um, twist at the, at the apex or point of the heart and the base. That's shown here. Of course, to, to do this, we had to build a control system. So we had to have hardware to go with it. We had to have regulators to regulate the pressure, valves to open to each of the airlines. Um, a data acquisition card to, con or to log data from the actuators and a software interface so we could control it. We wanted it to beat at the same time as the heart, and we wanted to trigger it from kind of a native heart signal, like an ECG signal. So we had come a small amount of the way towards realizing our vision, but that's all well and good in the lab on a, on a silicone rubber heart. Um, it's very different when you get to a real heart. So 
we have this sleeve now that, that can squeeze and twist, and, and when you put the two layers together, it can do both at the same time. But we moved on, um, and we realized that the heart isn't like a bulky kind of silicone thing on it, and, and the surgeons wanted to configure it so that they could place it exactly the way they wanted to. So we moved and we developed new fabrication methods to make a sleeve using flat fabrication of silicone sheets. Um, I even learned to sew on a sewing machine and use textiles to um, create um, a sleeve that the surgeons could suture onto the heart. And we did a lot of testing in the lab using just a, si a simple setup to measure the volume ejected with each beat and test out different configurations and different fabrication techniques. So eventually then, um, we moved to a real heart. And this is where, you know, we really see, is this technology going to work, this idea, you know, is, is it, is it going to fly? So the first time we put this on a, um, a heart, it was really exciting. And what we can do here is we can control the timing of the actuators. So they, from the bottom up, they're actuated uh, sequentially, and that can increase the, um, the output from the heart. So here you can see the sleeve on the heart, it conforms to the heart, moves with it, um, which is what we wanted. Um, and the idea is that if the heart is failing, this will kind of train the heart back into pumping enough blood out um, without contacting the blood, that's the key. And we really wanted it to be conforming to the surface of the heart. So again, we took advantage of some of the new imaging techniques. This is a CT scan looking at different cross sections of the device on the heart. Um, and you can see that it's, it's really hugging the outside surface of the heart well, um, coupled with it to achieve the motion. We had to um, design quite an intricate setup for testing this um, on a live model. We had to trigger it from the native heartbeat and we had to measure the performance of the device. So we had ultrasonic flow meters on the vessel coming out of the heart that could um, measure the flow and measure how we were improving function or, or not. Um, and we had to be able to trigger the timing as needed so that it really beat in sync with the heart and didn't, um, didn't adversely affect heart function. So it was really um, the end result we wanted. We finally achieved after multiple iterations um, and this is kind of the, the end result that we published re um, earlier this year. Um, this graph here, and I had to use a lot of self-restraint not to include more than one graph in this talk, but um, it, it basically shows on the left baseline function, cardiac output, um, and then we use a drug to induce acute heart failure, so it reduces the contractility of the heart muscle. Um, so the function significantly decreases. And then when we use our sleeve and actuate our sleeve, we can bring it back up to the baseline. These are acute studies, so they're not long-term. Um, but for us just to see that proof of concept that this works on a real heart, that was kind of the moment that we, the, we were waiting for. So um, all that project takes a lot of work. <laughs> um, I wouldn't have been able to do it without funding. Um, I'm currently funded by the IRC on a postdoc um, award in Galway. Um, and these are other funding sources that I had throughout my PhD. I had fantastic advisors and mentors as well that are listed here and a load of co-workers that helped out too. So I'm going to, um, I'm fortunate enough to have got a faculty position in MIT in Cambridge in Massachusetts. Um, I'll be... <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'll be starting a lab there and we'll be continuing working on this technology and on other similar technology um, in, in the new group. So um, I'll leave you with a video that summarizes the technology probably in a much shorter and better way than I did, but um, thank you for your time.